Okay, so you guys good? Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Um, my name is Wendy Wasserman. I'm the marketing director here at Politics and Prose. Um, we're super happy to have you all here. It's a beautiful day, so I'm glad that you uh, spent uh, sundown with us here. Um, I want to just introduce our speakers, and then we're going to do some uh, just quick housekeeping before um, we get on to the main show, as we were. I know that you're here for Kate Clancy, who has just Woo! written this fabulous book. Woohoo! Period, the real story of menstruation. Um, the, I, you need to buy the book. This is why you are here to buy the book. Let me say it again, buy the book. Um, Kate will be doing some signings afterwards. Uh, so the book is back there um, at the register so we know that you will buy it. Um, so Kate is the professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign where she holds appointments in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and the Program in Ecology, Evolution, Conservation Biology, and at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. Did I get that right? Yep. Sounds good? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> she is also written for National Geographic, Scientific American, and American Scientist. She's here with a good friend, good old friend. I understand these guys go way back um, with Ed Young. Young is a science journalist who reports for The Atlantic. And I just have to make a shameless plug. We are about to, uh, well, not about, but later this year, we will be moving our wharf location, if you haven't been there, now's the time, um, to the first floor of the new Atlantic building down at the wharf. So we're going to be neighbors. <laughs> Um, um, an Immense World, its second book, which I'm sure you have all bought, we now have signed copies here, um, was published in June 2022 and looks at the extraordinary sensory worlds of other animals. His first book, I Contain Multitudes, delved into the amazing partnerships between animals and microbes. That sounds pretty good, too. Um, so for some housekeeping, if you have a phone, turn it off. No beeping, singing, whatever, um, but feel free to take pictures. I hope that's okay with you guys, since we are filming. Um, we are filming here. Uh, we are both live streaming, and also um, we will have this video up on our YouTube channel shortly, in, a, in about a week or so. Um, chairs, you are all sitting on them, thank you. <laughs> Once uh, the talk is over and uh, we move to the signing line, we're going to ask you to help us by folding up the chairs. It's an old politics of prose tradition. If you've been here before, you know how it goes. Um, and we thank you for that um, proactively. Uh, we do have masks available for anybody who needs them. Um, and as you know, this is one of the many book talks we do uh, every month. We do probably oh, over 30, so count that up. That's more days than there are in a month. Uh, book talks here at the store. If you don't have a calendar, we recommend you grabbing one of these. And it also has our great events, uh, our great classes on the back. Um, these guys are going to talk for about uh, 30, 40, 35 minutes. We're in the ish zone. It says that's a thumbs up. Um, then after that, we're going to go to Q&A, uh, an open Q&A for Kate. Um, we're going to ask for anyone who wants to ask a question of Kate or Ed, for that matter, um, to come up to the mic. There's a mic over here just behind this, this white pillar. Two reasons to come up there. First of all, so these guys can hear your question. Very important can't answer it without being able to hear it and also so we can capture the audio for our video so so if you have a question just come up and line up Ed will tell us when we're getting ready to do Q&A um, all right so on to the main show as it was and on to Kate Clancy's period the real story of menstruation again you are supposed to buy the book it says here in really big letters so do do what I'm telling you to do um, <laughs> I was thinking about this book when I was reading it. Um, I was thinking about the 1960s film, The Fantastic Voyage, and was laughing about this earlier. How many people know this book or know the movie? Okay, this really dates me. I had to explain it to someone earlier. It made me feel really bad. Um, but, you know, in this, in this film, Raquel Wells, she gets in this cute little outfit, and then she goes on this voyage through people, this man's veins, um, and uh, she goes along with her scientific colleagues to wherever the bloodstream takes them and it was sort of like this imaginary fantastical way to think about inside of the body um, 
But when I was reading this book, I was thinking that this was a fantastic voyage, but not in this, like, I can't believe this is science fiction, but really in a, oh my God, really? That's how it works way? How come I didn't know that my brain is blown into bits and pieces? Which is a whole different uh, definition of fantastic. Um, so I, I think it's because Kate's operating question is really, why is it up until no, now no one has taken a fantastic voyage through the mechanics and meanings of menstruation? And why is it what we, why we know so little about menstruation, even though it, it is an event that occurs universally in the bodies of half the human population? So that's a crazy question. And why is it that what we do know about menstruation is not only misrepresented, mischaracterized, but it's also particularly misportrayed. So um, Clancy has a lot of theories as to why. They're going to talk about this today. From the biases built into scientific research to the eugenic history of gynecology to the misogynistic fictions about menstruation that every girl or menstruating person is told the minute they start to spot. Um, so move over, Isaac Asimov. Move over, Raquel Welch. Um, this is the real fantastic voyage. Um, she ha really blows the cover on all the stories we've been told, and it is the most fantastic voyage of all, period. So, go on. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I am incredibly excited. Um, Kate is a dear and old friend of mine. Um, she is also a hero of mine. She does incredible science, but she has also worked tirelessly, tirelessly to make science itself better. And I think that um, this book, this amazing book, is really the epitome of both of those things. Um, I, reading it, learned so much about that I didn't know about how the human body works. And I learned so much about why, in general, we know so little about this area of the body that is so universal uh, and so pervasive, and that we should treat with wonder and awe instead of disgust uh, and revulsion. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from Kate about the book today. And I, I guess just to begin with, I'd love to hear the origin story of period. Like, what, what made you decide to write this book about this topic? Sure. Well, <clears throat> well, you know I love a spite project. <laughs> I do. Um, and uh, that, you know, a lot of my research over the years has been motivated by something that makes me really angry. Um, and so uh, for many years, I had taken a huge, I'd been studying menstrual cycles my entire professional career. That was a big part of what my lab did. Um, but then I had taken this sort of left turn for a while and been doing a lot of work on sexual harassment. Um, you know, like testifying in front of Congress, uh, you know, helping with um, just, you know, doing some National Academies work, doing a lot of published research on it. Um, and it was just getting really hard in a lot of ways. Um, I'm a, you know, uh, I'm a assault survivor myself. It's been, it's really hard to do that work. It's hard to be a researcher and an advocate in that space and be someone who's experienced those things and be someone who people are constantly coming to you and asking you for help because of your expertise, especially when most of the time the help they're asking for is help you can't give um, because of how broken the system is. And so I kind of hit this point where <laughs> I really wanted to just get back to studying periods again. Um, and I thought, why not do something I've never done before that's really, really hard, like write a book about it. Uh, and A famously restorative activity to do. Exactly. <laughs> it's been stress-free, um, you know, uh, and on top of my meditating an hour every morning and an hour every evening, I just sort of write all day. It's just delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the, the, the thing is, is that a lot of, in a lot of ways, that left turn actually did bring me back to periods because there are these ways in which I think a lot of what I learned about the process of science and the practice of science um, is something that I couldn't help but bring back into studying menstrual cycles again, is that I couldn't look away from practice and process and start to ask questions about that when it came back to my own work. Uh, and did that, did, um did the practice and process bit, like everything that you had experienced and learned about through the work on sexual harassment, did it change your understanding of like the, the sort of cultural history of, of periods, like that, that part of your research? I had already, yes and no. I already knew a lot of the, 
a lot of the history was stuff I had written about even as a blogger back in the blogger days. Yeah. Um, it's for Scientific American and other places. I had all, and, and actually in my undergrad thesis, um, mm -hmm. I had already done a lot on sort of like the history of the menotoxin. Um, what actually really changed was how I re-narrated some of the stories of some of the women scientists who had been really mocked and derided. Um, so Rose Frisch is someone that I write about really differently in the book than I think I have thought about her previously. She's thought, you know, she's thought of as this person who um, had this really half-baked, terrible idea about how we, about why we hit menarche when we do, and that it's about um, achieving a certain critical fatness. And people were highly critical of her work, even though many, many people found deep comfort in what she was saying. Um, and she wasn't totally right, but she got us, she set us on a path. Um, and the same was true of Margie Prophet, who is someone who um, really pushed against some of our early ideas of the evolution of menstruation and why it evolved. And it's because of her that we have, um, and, and again, she wasn't right, but the way that she was wrong was really helpful, so. So, um, there is, uh, reading the book, it, it, I felt like there were two really huge challenges that you had to contend with. And one you mentioned in the very first line of the introduction, which is that you were confronted with a lot of disgust um, in talking to people about this project. And the disgust that surrounds menstruation is, is pervasive, it's an area full of taboo. Um, and we'll talk about why that is, um, but I wanted to ask like, how you approached that challenge. I, I guess you know, in, in lots of different contexts, as someone who menstruates, as someone who studies menstruation, as someone who's writing a book about menstruation. Right? Hmm. I think the main, I, I think part of it is that, and this is maybe getting back to my roller derby days, but um, like when I notice um, hesitation or disgust or discomfort, I tend to lean into it. Um, I'm kind of a terrible person. <laughs> and so when I notice that something grosses you out, I'm like, can I just dig a little more? Um, and I think that's where a lot of my initial curiosity came from, actually, as I was speaking to a professor back when I was an undergrad. And I said, I really, you know, I know that we study ovarian hormones and we're so curious about what estrogen and progesterone are doing, but what about periods themselves? And he wrinkled his nose and leaned back. And immediately I was like, ooh, I want to know more. And so I think part of it was just constitutionally, I'm a jerk, so. <laughs> right, right. It's less a spike project and more a spike career, right? Yes, yes. Um, OK, so I wanted to start by, by framing for the, the audience like some of the, the extent of some of the misconceptions we have around, around menstruation. And um, I want to start by talking about the, the idea of a menstrual cycle and the idea specifically that there is this normal 28-day, very predictable cycle that um, that you know the average person has, and the book very clearly d disabuses us of that notion. Can you say more about that? Sure. Um, so I'm going to go a little nerdy here for just a moment. Um, you know, you all learned how to do average, like how to calculate averages in school, right? You remember how to do that. Um, one of the things that's tricky is that the more you look at data, um, the more like not great it is to calculate averages, right? We notice things are not normally distributed, or we notice that they're bimodally distributed, meaning there's like a clump here and another clump here, but the average is actually where nobody is. Um, that happens in human data all the time. Um, but if you use an average, like with ovarian hormones, um, if you calculate, if you take a whole bunch of people and you calculate their average estrogen and progesterone, um, it's going to create a certain appearance of cycle. Um, but when you look at any given cycle, it doesn't look anything like that. And we were, I mean, even I was struck by this because we were trying to figure out um, why the program we were running to help us detect ovulation and um, timing of ovulation to help us align the cycles, why it wasn't working for like a third <laughs> of our participants. Um, and the reason for that is that like, that's just not how our participants, and these are all ovulatory cycles. Most of these folks are Paris, meaning they've had kids. So nothing wrong with their menstrual cycles. It's just that they don't actually look like the average. And, and that means that like irregular menstrual cycles are actually regular. And I, I think I was really struck by that in the book. They are this, this idea that um, the vast majority, nearing, approaching like all people, are going through something that um, because of the way we framed the normal cycle makes them feel abnormal. And actually that is the norm. 
right? Exactly. And it's not just, it's, that's the norm for when it comes to understanding menstrual cycles. It's also the norm when it comes to age at menarche. And so one of the other beliefs that we've developed <laughs> is that you, know, you are either early or you are late. And there is tons of hand wringing around this. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, she's developing so early. What's going to happen? Or she's developing so late. This is so bad. And when you actually, um, there's, <laughs> there's this one study I talk about in the book where, um, they, where they asked a whole bunch of people, OK, when did you get your first period? How old were you? And then do you consider yourself to be early, on time, or late? And um, almost nobody considered themselves to be on time. The early folks were, uh, I think, um, 9 to 11 and a half years is when they hit menarche. The late folks were 12 to 14. So there was only like a half year period <laughs> that was considered normal, um, even though that whole wide range, all of that is actually quite typical. So tell us about why that variation exists, because I think that's a really important like taken from this. It's not just that what we know is is wrong. It, it's also that we really aren't appreciating just how contextual and dynamic and, and frankly interesting um, the the menstrual cycle is. It's not like it's not irregular because of some weird process. It, it's because it's it's actually incredibly like finely tuned to the experiences that we're going through. Right. So. The way to think about something like a menstrual cycle is think of it as a flexibly responsive system. Um, the, the thing that evolution is acting on is our ability to respond to environment. So if you think about it that way, and like anybody in here who has any evolutionary bio training, this is familiar to you, right? But if you're thinking about the system in terms of how is it, res you know, how is it responding to environment, then you understand that variation is how it should look and that actually an invariant menstrual cycle would actually indicate maybe something's wrong, whereas one that is responsive to context is one that's doing exactly what it should be doing. And, so, and this also um, feels relevant to the, the idea of um, premenstrual syndrome. Right? Like, so um, in, in that section of the book, you also write about how um, the experiences that menstruating people have are as much to do uh, with things like the support they, they experience and um, the, the context around them as it is about the symptoms themselves. Is that right? Right. There's this um, work by Jane Usher, who uh, does some really interesting sort of feminist psychology research on premenstrual syndrome. Um, and there are, what she has found is that the, your partner actually plays a really strong role in how you experience premenstrual syndrome. Um, she was looking at, um, uh, opposite sex couples and same sex couples. And she found, you know, for the most part, it was the opposite sex couples where the male partner was not real, was fairly dismissive of the person's experiences. And so therefore that actually worsened their experience. Whereas, um, you know, in the same sex partner situation, they were more likely to be supported, acknowledged. They were like, oh yes, this is familiar to me. <laughs> so um, a little more compassion for the experience. And again, I think it's less about, um, you know, the gender of your partner and more, again, like how supportive and understanding you are of a lived experience that actually attenuates in some way how you're actually having those symptoms. Yeah, I, I like reading about all this, I just get this image of the menstrual cycle as this massive like integrator of all of your experiences, like across the, the, the your, across your life, the psychosocial stresses that you write about and actually producing something that is that, that tailors your biology to something very, very responsive to everything you've been through. Right. Um, there are these, the sort of three, I consider them like the meat and potatoes chapters of the book. Uh, there's one on like energetics, one on immune stressors, and one on psychosocial stressors. And for each one of them, I'm trying to sort of tease apart the different mechanisms through which environment gets into the body. Um, and to show how messy it is that like what we're talking about, like with energetics, it's in some ways the simplest story, because if you don't have enough resource, that's going to mean you don't have enough necessarily to put into your, you know, to put into your ovarian hormones. But for immune function and for psychosocial stressors, it's actually a lot messier. And it's more about like disrupting the signal um, than about a straight like resource allocation problem. And I think this idea of um, menstruation as this very sort of dynamic responsive force is so counter to the way it's often thought about as something that's very passive and and like almost functionless. Or you write about these this long-standing idea that 
menstruation sort of doesn't have a point, that it, that it is um, biologically useless. It's just what happens when tissue dies and is, re and is removed. And that's not what's going on. Right. The, and this is actually something that surprised me too, because, and again, in terms of when I was saying before, there are certain things that I would say, I would I re-narrate or I think about differently now, having written the book, um, than maybe back when I was first being taught or trained on these things. And the big one for me is on the evolution of menstruation, is that you know there was this early history around um, menotoxins, so this idea that the body is inherently like, the the body is inherently toxic and needs to, you know, uh, remove nastiness from the body. Um, but then there was this move towards uselessness and this idea that the system, it's just that menstruation is useless, um, which just so happened to come at about the same time we were also saying pendulous breasts were useful, useless. We were also saying clitorises were useless. We were also saying clitoral orgasm was useless. I don't know if you're noticing any trends about the things that we are tending to see are useless. Um, but it was, there's been some more research in the last 10 plus years um, around the function of menstruation that really reveals, one, that it's not just a process of removal, it's also a simultaneous process of healing, but that on top of it, that process itself is practice to allow the uterine infrastructure to learn how to get better for potentially, you know, um, for potentially pregnancy down the line. And tell us more about the, the healing and the, the repair process. So I think you, you write about like actually what's in menstrual blood um, that, that makes it clear that it's not just this waste product. Right, there's like, I mean, there's a ton of stuff in there. You can find some really, <laughs> there's some really good papers that are like, we, we had these people wear menstrual cups for a couple hours and then we dumped it out and we saw what was inside. Um, and there's, you know, there's mesenchymal stem cells, there's inflammatory cytokines, there's all sorts of healing factors. Um, there are tons of things found in menstrual blood that are found um, that are not necessarily found in peripheral blood or found in different proportion than in peripheral blood. Um, and a lot of those things, again, because menses is hanging out in the uterine cavity for a while before it makes its way out. While it's hanging out in that uterine cavity, it is contributing to the healing process and the regrowth of the uterus at the same time. I, I love that idea of it doing something active and also about just sort of kind of tr priming the uterus to be the r like uh, uh, a supportive environment for for an embryo like I, I think that's it's so counter to how we we typically think of it and it makes um it makes the process it makes the blood feel ki kind of wondrous right right and it really shifts the narrative from menstruation as like failure <laughs> right. um to menstruation as practice right um you know I, again on the one hand you know they're definitely been times in my life when I've been very relieved to get my period. <laughs> so there are, you know, knowing that that is a signal that there is not an embryo anywhere. That's like, that's a, that is a signal that many of us have been comforted by over the years. Um, but at the same time, again, we have the opportunity to rethink it, not just as failure to not make a baby, but another opportunity for practice. And I think also testament to like, what a uterus is capable of. I mean, the, you, you talked about the, the healing and the repair side of it. I mean, I, I was reading that, rereading that um, uh, yesterday, and like, I have a, a scrape on my wrist from about a week ago when I cut it on some cardboard, and it's still like got a bit of scar tissue, and it's like very visible. And like, um, a, a uterus like goes through far more, more significant change on a monthly cycle, and it's just like fine without accumulating scar right. tissue. It, can, it cannot afford to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. No, it as pathetic as my wrist is. <laughs> it's much better. Um, so, okay. We, we've talked a little bit about, uh, we talked a lot about um, some of the misconceptions we have about menstruation. And, and I really wanted to now dig into like, why, why we have that. Um, why, do, why don't we know more? And why do we have so many um, uh, misconceptions and so many derogatory notions about it? Um, there, I, it's, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to think back like where, at what point do I start? How many hundreds <laughs> of years ago do I go? Um, I think there's a lot of Western science you can trace to sort of tell this story, um, from the earliest textbooks that covered, uh, uteruses and, and covered, um, reproduction, um, literally having things, quotes in them saying things like woman is not human, but a monster. Um, 
you know, and, and in fact, the people who were producing these documents and telling these stories um, had never actually um, had like female patients, had never actually um, done autopsies or any type of other exploratory work to understand bodies that have uteruses. Um, and, you know, and yet, you know, somehow magically it's the folks who don't necessarily have the expertise who are setting the terms for how it is that we understand a body. So I think that's a big part of it is that that's been going on for centuries. Um, and that even though I think there are, and there are some amazing books out there, if you do like to read history, a number of amazing women's uh, sort of women's history books that you can read about the ways in which um, a lot of people have been able to take that power back over the years through practices of midwifery and more. Um, but at the end of the day, this book is a story about Western science and Western science has actually kept that, ex you know, the expertise and the experience out of the hands of people who have uteruses for the most part. And so, you know, for the last 100 years and more, unless 150 years, um, you know, we haven't been able to share knowledge in the way that we have. We haven't been able to help each other out in the way that has been a part of our longer history. Um, and I think that's a big part of it is that, you know, if the people who are setting the terms for how we do our clinical research, for the kinds of questions that we ask, the kind of work that we do, then in the end, those questions may or may not actually serve the people who have those bodies. I, it's such a great example of how science isn't this, you know, neutral, um, purely empirical force of discovery that it's often caricatur car caricaturized as, that it is in fact dependent on who gets to ask questions in the first place, what kind of questions they think to ask, their background, their values, and all of that. I think it's a, it's a great example of that. And I think that's also why eugenics plays such a big role, um, is that, you know, the, at the same time that the Comstock Law was happening, um, that gynecology was being professionalized, this was also when eugenics, especially American eugenics, was sort of starting to get a real toehold and growing in strength. And that's where a lot of the concepts we have, um, the modern concepts we have of normality come from, is from taking a really select sample um, and then calculating averages within this select sample and then applying that to everybody. And then of course, somehow magically, that means that a huge proportion of the population is no longer normal and you get to categorize them as not worthy of having children or you know, um, they should be sterilized or whatever. And that, that's, that's a huge part of, the, of sort of the gynecological history of periods as well. Can you also tell us a bit more about the um, origin of some of the taboos that exist around menstruation? Because I think that's, that's part of it too. It, it, it actively causes this um, lack of study that we've talked about. I think, I mean, a, part, a lot of this again is both Western science and Western culture. And um, to, in, a, in a way, like the best example to my mind of that is actually the ways in which um, menstrual taboos do not, in fact, exist in a lot of other cultures. Um, so for a long time, uh, a lot of Western anthropologists, I am an anthropologist, this is my beloved history, uh, also a ton of anthropologists were, were eugenicists. So, yay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, anthropologists have this really bad habit, especially, you know, in our past, of assuming that because of, and I say us, meaning historically, mostly white men from, say, uh, mostly Western European countries, going to the other and then going and studying them and assuming that they have objectivity because of their positionality. When in fact what they're doing is enforcing their own set of beliefs onto or, or using that to interpret what they're learning. And so a lot of the early things that we thought we knew from Western anthropology and from ethno ethnographic work on menstrual seclusion, um, men's, uh, various types of rules around menses. Um, a lot of those were basically like, these things are bad. Menstrual seclusion is bad. Menstrual taboos, rules around food you can and cannot eat. These are all bad because you're telling women they have to go do this stuff over here. Whereas the people who are actually having these experiences are like, do you know how nice it is to go somewhere else for a few days? <laughs> do you know, like, I can go and make a palm nut stew that instead of having it just take an hour and having it taste okay, I can cook it for like five <laughs> hours and it's delicious. And it's like a completely different experience. And so those, like, 
again, it's sort of in the counter examples, I think that we understand how much our own understanding of the of and how much Western culture, I should say, has influenced uh, and misinterpreted a lot of a, a lot of um, practices all over the world. And it, it's not um, it's not only about um, misinterpreting what you study, but it's also about what you deem to be worth studying in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, Menses itself has been understudied because partly it was seen as useless for so long, right? Um, and, be, or, and or because of the whole, well, this is just, this just signals a failure. This means, you know, the embryo isn't doing its thing. There's no implantation. And so because of that, it was not understood in its own right to have any particular, um, to have any particular value. The other thing is that Menses and experiences of menstrual cycles um, especially if we're not thinking about it in the context of embryos and fertility and pregnancy, um, a lot of what we're dealing with then are diffuse, uncertain symptoms, chronic pain, pelvic pain, um, the kinds of things that we don't tend to put a lot of attention on. So if it's not directly related to fertility, <laughs> um, then we don't, th there has not been as much of a history of actually studying those other portions of the menstrual cycle. This is why it takes 10 years sometimes to be diagnosed with endometriosis. That's why we still don't have a good blood test to measure endo. And instead you have to do laparoscopic surgery to find lesions um, in order to be believed. <laughs> um, you know, and there are all of these, for a lot of these various conditions, the, um, the burden of, of effort you have to put into it as the patient is enormous because we haven't put a lot of work into figuring out different diagnostics and different treatments. Because as you as you write, it, it's it's like there are there are only two outcomes, right? Like it's either protect um, women's ability to have a baby at all costs, or ignore everything else. Exactly, and this is another place where race and eugenics sneak in too. Because when we're talking about protecting fertility, we have a long history of protecting white fertility, but not necessarily the fertility of other groups, and so and or or in fact expressly, right, sterilizing. Um, people without their consent, uh, if they were not, if they weren't white, if they weren't able-bodied, and more. I think some of these issues, um, it, you know, it's 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 tempting to sort of view them with a historic, with an only historical lens, but they're very much modern-day issues. And um, you know, th this this idea of um, finding this whole area not worth studying uh, and disregarding people's symptoms and experiences is something that you very much bumped into when you wanted to study COVID vaccines mm -hmm. um, and their link to menstrual cycle. Can you tell us more about what, what happened? Sure. So um, one of my former students, her name is Katie Lee. She's now a professor at Tulane, um, but she was associated, she was a postdoc in a medical school. So she was one of the early folks who got like the first round of um, COVID vaccines and she had a little group chat of other people who were going through this as well. Um, and she reached out to me and she said, hey, some of us are having some weird period symptoms. Do you know anything about it? And I hadn't had the shot or paid attention to it at all at the time. So I said no, but very shortly after um, I had the worst period of my life. Like if you remember, if you've ever had a, a one so heavy where you're literally just kind of like sitting there and you're like, I am just existing. <laughs> while this passes through my body. Like that was the kind of period I was having through back-to-back -back Zoom meetings in my guest bedroom, right? Um, and so when I asked Twitter, because that's what I do, is ask Twitter things, um, it got a ton of attention because a lot of people, and, and so I'm a, a, a more or less regularly menstruating person, by which I mean obviously tons of variation, but I, I do get a lot of periods. And um, what was really interesting is that it wasn't just folks who were um, fairly regularly menstruating who were noticing heavier bleeding. The other thing we started to notice is that a lot of people who were on long acting hormonal contraception, like the IUD, um, or postmenopausal people were saying, I'm having breakthrough bleeding. And that was something that even as we were trying to pay attention to the heavier bleeding, nobody wanted to pay any attention to. Um, so we were really concerned about gender dysphoria, like people who are on gender affirming hormones suddenly getting a breakthrough bleed and how awful that might be. Um, not because we then think, well, then you shouldn't have this treatment, but that it will help you immensely to know that might happen, right? That, there, that all of us deserve transparency in the kinds of treatments we have, and that there is, in fact, and this is, this is not in the book because this is stuff we're working on right now in the lab, but we've been doing a lot of research 
a lot of follow-up work with our participants on medical betrayal and on what's called sentiment analysis. So like, what are the kinds of um, emotion words that they're, they're using in their long responses? And one of the things we're really struck by is, you know, when we do the sentiment analysis, the vast majority of people have negative and then positive. And we were trying to figure out, well, what exactly in that huge group, why are they all negative words and then positive words? And it's because they're describing, well, I had this, I had fatigue, I felt so terrible, I was in so much pain, it was such a, it was surprisingly uncomfortable, but I am so grateful I got that vaccine. Mm. That is what they were saying. They weren't, they weren't, the people who were saying they were pissed about it were not people saying, first started telling stories of negative symptoms. They were the ones who had gone to doctors and then doctors had been dismissive or rude or discounted them. So our sentiment analysis right now is showing that it's not like vaccine, like what we're sort of projecting from this or inferring from this is that vaccine hesitancy isn't produced by not bothering to study these things and not informing people of potential things that might happen because actually that provides a lot of comfort. What, it, what you can the run the risk of by doing that and not providing transparency and providing these sort of betraying experiences when you go to a doctor and then they tell you what you're experiencing isn't real, that's where hesitancy can happen, is in that moment of betrayal where you are made to feel like your experiences don't matter. And that is the experience of having a uterus and going to a doctor, <laughs> right? So this was, for a lot of folks, this wasn't, and again, from our analyses of the qualitative data, like this isn't the first, this isn't the first time for them that they're having this experience, right? This is the 10th or the 20th time that they've gone to a doctor and been made to feel small. And that is the thing that made them full of rage to the point that we ended up creating a whole separate file called, if you'll excuse my language, called the fucks file because of all the people who were swearing very angrily about their experiences with doctors when they tried to figure out what was going on with them. And, and I guess you also had some of that in the response to this work um, with people telling you that it you know, wasn't a thing or that you're feeling anti-vax um, uh, sentiments. But I think like one of the really interesting bits of pushback was that um, there is no like there is no biological mechanism that would explain this right there, there is no there is no reason why a vaccine shot should lead to heavier bleeding. And, and in fact, there is, and it sort of ties back to everything we said at the start of this about the responsiveness of the menstrual cycle. Can you say more about that? Sure. Your immune system, I mean, like every, I was just talking to someone the other day who's an immunologist who was like, every organ in your body is an immune organ. Because I was sort of saying, you know, the uterus is an immune organ. And she's like, they all are. <laughs> and I mean, she's right in some ways, right? All of these, all of, like, our body has to be responsive because we have to worry about parasites, we have to worry about wounds that we need to heal, viruses, and more. The uterus is responsive to immune stress, immune challenges, and it's responsive to inflammation. And what is one of the major mechanisms by which uh, the immune system works? Through bleeding and clotting. What's the organ in our body that does lots of bleeding and clotting? <laughs> like. Come on. <laughs> it was just so frustrating. The, the no biological mechanism phrase appeared in five or six different articles by five or six different MDs pushing back on our work um, before we even completed the work, right? They were just like, off, you know, from the jump, I'm saying this is BS. Um, and I really think that, you know, five seconds of understanding this system and this organ makes it really clear that that's an incredibly unfair characterization of it. Um, we are getting close to when I think we should start the Q&A. So I'm going to ask one last question, which is for readers of this book, for the people who are going to buy this book <laughs> and read it, what do you hope that they get from it? What, what, do, you, what do you hope period does for its readers? So, so the only chapter we haven't talked that much about is the final chapter. And the last chapter is about period futures. Um, and there's a way, and I, get, I talk about this in the beginning and the end of the book in terms of my approach as a scientist, but also my approach just as a person in the world, is that um, I was a union organizer for years in graduate school. And um, my union activity was incredibly important to me. It shaped me as a person. It made me, it, it is why I have spite projects. It is why as a scientist, I, the work that I do is motivated in the way that it is. And um, if you don't know much about unions, I was a union organizer at Yale 
which you might imagine is not super pro-union. I organized, I was there for six years. I organized full-time basically for five of them. And I was, I had, I was arrested twice. I was on strike twice, one in a blizzard. Um, I, we lost a vote and I left without us ever having won. We finally won this past year, our union. So the grad students at Yale, it's a really big deal. And because of the timing of this book coming out, I couldn't go to the reunion, but I saw all of the pictures on Facebook and it's like all my friends with grown children and gray hair. And there was this thing that I've been reflecting on since I saw all those pictures. And it's that the nature of hope in a lot of ways is that you, the kind of work that you choose to do as a person is not necessarily work you do knowing that you're gonna get a payoff in your lifetime or in your time on the project or whatever, right? Um, a lot of the things that I do are about setting something in motion, calling attention to something, um, telling people this doesn't have to be how it is. And I think that's the approach I want people to have after reading this book is that hope, you know, to borrow from <laughs> you know, from Marian Kaba and many others, hope is a discipline, right? It's a, it's a practice of eternal optimism, but that's actually more work than pessimism. And I think when we wanna think about the kind of future we build within the sciences, the kind of future we build within medicine, the, the approaches that we try to take about underserved people and underserved bodies is that we have to continue to hold that hope. And I, that's the lens that I want people to take, not just out of like, how do we study periods, but how do we move through the world, right? If you want to, if you're all about abolition, if you're all about community, um, what kind of decisions are you making in a pandemic to keep everybody around you safe? If you, you know, if you want, if you want to, you know, like what kind of hyper-local things are you doing to produce change? You know, those are the kinds of things I hope, and again, it's a book about periods, but it's also a book about disability justice. It's a book about colonialism. It's a book about sexism and racism. And so, at the end of the day, that's what I would like people to bring. Kate Clancy. All right, I'm sure you have questions. Please come up to the microphone and ask them. Hi, wonderful talk, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious, I'm thinking a lot about the history of taboos that you talked about and the mis or even disinformation and all of that that's just promulgated around and we've all internalized. So I'm kind of curious about the funding landscape, and I assume you've had a lot of experiences. Um, I'm, ho I'm hoping they're getting better, but I'm curious what that, the shape of that has been like for you. Is there anyone from the NIH here? Me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have applied to the NIH. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. I've never been funded. Um, there was supplemental funding <coughs> created for studying how the vaccines affect menses that was inspired by our research, and we didn't get that money. Five other groups got it, and our group did not. We applied for it. Um, the last rejection we just got said, you know, now that, now that other groups are doing this, th literally the feedback was, well, you've addressed our changes in this RO3 resubmission, now that you've done that, um, you know, now we're kind of moving on from this and we don't really need this data anymore. <laughs> so, so like the feedback has been, anybody from NSF here? <laughs> <laughs> NSF is typically uh, a lot more interested in basic work and so basic science research and so I tend to have a lot more luck there. Um, but basically in terms of the, not to just like complain about my problems, but like the, the funding landscape to me is one where, you know, if the cutting edge of the status quo is what we're always going to fund, right, then there is no room for the types of feminist questions with a grounded approach that a lot of my work tries to do. We do an emergent methodology that um, is informed by what our participants tell us, you know, and you can't, it's really hard to design a study that does that that fits into like an NIH model because that takes so much longer and it's not going to be a randomized clinical trial. It's going to be retrospective. Um, the one last thing I'll say about that is that when we think about methods, when we're ranking them or thinking about them, um, when people are applying for funding, we tend to have this idea that um, patients are lying liars 
because we're like retrospective analyses, meaning asking people about their histories are flawed. And you know, we should do this thing where we don't totally tell them why they're participating in this study because we might bias them. So we ask certain questions in a certain order because our stupid patients are lying liars. The whole infrastructure of how we ask participants questions assumes that they don't know themselves and that they're too stupid to understand what we're trying to do. And yet, we're the ones with all the bias. <laughs> like scientists have, or at least we have the same amount of bias, but we aren't designing studies that are taking our bias necessarily out of it. We're trying to remove, through the ordering of demographic questions and other things, we're trying to remove what our patients might want to say, but actually ordering it in this other way and priming them might be better. I'll finally stop. <laughs> I, I beg you not to. Please. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the consequences of losing weight quickly and the disappearing, disappearance of the period. What does that, what does that to your body? And if girls uh, or women in general are happy about not having their period? This is a, I'm really glad you asked that question because it's actually a, in a lot of ways a tricky one to answer or it really requires a lot of nuance. Because on the one hand, like I said before, the system is responsive. So it should respond to a huge weight loss or a huge shift in energy balance where you're not eating enough to support your activity. It should respond with loss of the menstrual cycle eventually if you're doing severely enough. Uh, really with like a little bit, what, there's, there's a whole graded spectrum. So you first lose a little bit of luteal function, your progesterone goes down. Then down the line, you lose ovulation. Then the cycle starts to get irregular, and then you can totally lose it. So on the one hand, that means the system is working as designed. <laughs> um, and if that happens occasionally, right, that's not necessarily terrible. <laughs> um, what is not good is if that happens for a long enough period of time that you are depriving your body of estrogen that you are, what that real, because what that also means is if you don't have enough energy for periods, there's a lot of other things you don't have energy for, right? For, you don't have an energy for making bones, you don't have energy for supporting your immune system. So there's been this huge shift when we think about energy constraint and the effects on the body. We used to mostly really worry about loss of the period and how too much exercise or too little food could affect um, people with uteruses. But we now have redefined the female athlete triad as red S, relative energy deficiency in sport, because we now recognize that this is harmful for all bodies. So that's, that's sort of the, the one other thing I'll say is that the, the other reason why it is really important to pay attention to it and to, um, and, and again, if we're talking about like one missed period is one missed period, but we're talking about multiple, um, is that because of the way fat phobia operates within, a, within Western science and within Western culture, we tend to over worry about how um, more adipose tissue negatively affects menstrual cycles, but the effect of too little uh, fat tissue or too little weight on menstrual cycles is far, far greater. Um, and you see you know, people with subclinical eating disorders or more, um, you see much greater effects in the menstrual cycle than someone who weighs outside of a BMI range that was in fact designed by a eugenicist. So. There's that eugenics again. I don't think, I don't think I'll be able to ask this without, uh, without taking a great risk and, and uh, making clear for you to see some ignorance. But when it comes to the genders, ignorance does often come with being male. But how do you keep faith in the ability of men to uh, expand uh, their horizons, expand uh, their minds, and uh, listen and absorb what you have to say, because I imagine it's a daily challenge, and it must come with frustrations I could not possibly begin to perceive without asking questions like this one. Thank you. I think um, I don't particularly have faith that m men will magically start to care. That's actually, I mean, and the reason I, I say that because what I'd rather see is a shift in balance of power, right? Um, so two things. One is, you know, obviously I think we need 
a lot more people of color. I think we need um, a whole variety of genders practicing science um, and certainly more women to be practicing science. Um, and I think that that, and then they also need to be listened to and put in leadership roles. And then it doesn't matter what any one gender thinks. Um, I think, but I think the other thing is that there are, and, and this is again a union thing, um, but like back in my union days, um, there were two things that I learned. One is you can only teach the people who are in front of you. So you can only work with people who are actually receptive to what you have to say. So I don't try to change people who aren't receptive. Um, so I consider, you showed up, so I'm, I'm operating on the assumption you all are receptive. Um, and then the other one is that when it comes to true leadership, nobody can really build relationships with more than seven people. That was the Unite Here model at least. Um, and so for me, it's less, it's less like, what do I think about the male gender and more who's in front of me and, and do they wanna work with me? Thank you though. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. I'm glad to see you're both wearing masks. It's kind of too bad that most of the people here aren't, but that's another story. Um, an anthropological question and a biological question. <clears throat> in terms of the way women and menstruation and reproductive issues were treated, what have you learned about the fact you would have a woman gynecologist as opposed to a male gynecologist play out? And a question manifesting my total biological ignorance. Any idea as to the number of eggs that we women start out with? I know it gets winnowed down and winnowed down, but, but how is the original number determined? It's hundreds of thousands. Millions. Millions, yeah. okay, that shows my ignorance already. Um, and I think we should have courses in elementary and middle and high school about basic biology. Most of us are totally ignorant. Yeah, thank you. Um, wait, so now I need to work back because okay. when, when I'm in this sort of setting, uh, my brain goes blank. So the first question okay. on uh, anthropology, this was the gynecology question, yeah, right? Women versus male physicians. So your provider does matter a ton for the type of treatment you receive. Um, you know, the, some of the stuff that I talk about in the book is around uh, how long it takes to receive pain medication. People of color, take a lot, it takes a lot longer for them to get um, pain medication, especially if their provider is white. Um, we also see changes, differences in um, receiving pain medication if the patient is female. So there are a lot of, you know, that's just one example, but absolutely the, the provider that you have does matter in some really big ways. For the second one, I actually, as I'm thinking, I think it's something like 900,000 is what we start off with um, in terms of numbers of eggs, but you'll have to buy the book to find the answer <laughs> because it's in there. <laughs> um, but the winnowing is a really cool process. Like the process of follicular atresia is super cool. And the fact that we're like, let's start with a crap ton and then like work down to our favorites. Um, it's like a really neat process um, that I do talk about in the book, which you can buy. Um, but I, I, you know, I think, and one of the other things that I say is that like this, it is ex this is exactly the kind of process we should be teaching in school because it does offer so many insights into so many other processes of the body. It helps us think about immune function. It helps us think about reproduction. You know, um, it, in so many ways, I think it captures a lot of really cool things that we wouldn't otherwise get to know about. And so I actually do think that like, I, I'd be way more into learning about periods in school and menstrual cycles than about like, you know, Punnett squares with the green peas versus the wrinkled peas and Mendel, especially because we know that's not even actually how genetic inheritance works. <laughs> so like, why are we teaching Punnett squares when we could be teaching periods? Thank you, thank you. The, the bit in the book that answers this question is very, very cool, which you will discover when you buy the book. Um, it also has the incredible line, the ovaries are always up to something. Hi, thank you both for a really cool discussion. I have a question for you about um, if you could talk a little bit about technology uh, and how that uh, affects people's experience with the period. Because you know you have femtech and you have lots of new ways in which uh, technology is interfacing with the way we experience our bodies phenomenologically and everything. And I was wondering, you know, what could you tell us a little bit about where technology and the body intersect with sex and gender with respect to periods? Right, it, it's a huge topic. Um, a couple of quick things I'll say is that what's interesting to me is that a lot of our more recent moves in femtech have been around surveillance. That's where a lot of, I mean, that's where a lot of technology is right now is let's find another way to surveil people. 
Um, and so, uh, and, and that's dangerous right now, frankly. I mean, it's always dangerous, but it's especially dangerous right now with um, post Dobbs um, to have our menstrual cycles surveilled in the way that they are with apps and stuff like that. Um, but Femtech also, again, if you expand it and you think about the history of, uh, of women's medicine, and um, there is a really cool story to be told around how it is that menstrual pads and tampons first came to be used, but also the feminist activists who pushed against um, super absorbent tampons that were causing toxic shock syndrome. So again, in terms of asking the question of like, who's in the room when decisions are made about what products we need or what technologies we need, um, no one was actually using um, any type of liquid that clotted when they were doing their early tests. So they were just using like blue saline. So you know the ads of like pouring blue stuff? That's actually also experimentally how they were testing absorbency of pads and tampons is just like blue saline. And it was because of feminist activists that they started using a heparin solution that actually clotted that gave them better insight into how the tampons would work in an actual body. That is how the standards for absorbency for pads got created. I mean, for tampons got created, where because people said, no, I insist on being in the room. I would like to have more of a say in this thing that I am purchasing from you. So, you know, again, when we, you know, when we better democratize, um, you know, product development and how we think about things rather than keeping it corporate and capitalistic, I think it gives us more of a chance to produce things that people actually need. Oh, hello. Uh, just a quick question. Is there any science behind syncing up like with your roommates, coworkers, or is that Sorry. just like bullshit? No. no. <laughs> the, the, so the quick answer, and actually I saw something in your recent book, Ed, which you should also buy Ed's book, um, that, uh, that confirmed for me. So I, if you all know what a vomeronasal organ is, it's the organ to help detect pheromones. We don't have a functioning one, and that's the story I'd always been told for why the sinking thing doesn't really work, along with there's other statistical things I could talk about that I won't right now. But the, in terms of pheromone detection, we don't have a realistic way to do it among humans. And I was like, has that changed? <laughs> and then I saw in your book, um, it looks like it hasn't, and I tried to go to the literature to, conf like, to just be sure. Um, and yeah, we still just don't have any insight into like, what mechanism could possibly do it but also it's very easy for periods to feel like a coincidence because of the way that they're timed and how long they last. So there's, there's ways in which we have a natural inclination to, to sense them, but also um, we, there's no mechanism by which it could work. I love that you fact checked my book. This is why we're friends. <laughs> it's more the other way around is that actually I used your book to fact check <laughs> my understanding of it, but. Um, hello, um, I am. I have so much admiration for your spike career, um, <laughs> and um, from from your union organizing days to being a feminist in science. And the system that makes your book so important to us is also the system you had to create the book in. Um, and I'm blown away by how much life and love you have for for the science. And I wish you could tell us more about how you kept that sustainable for yourself. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, I think, I mean, a couple of things, you know, like I'll try not to cry and about like, and say that like my kids are part of it. Right. Like I think when I, I, I joke a lot about spike projects and I do literally in my office have various quotes in my office that are like things people have said to me or things that I mantras, I say to myself about the mediocrity of people who try to make decisions about my life. Uh, this, a couple of years ago, recently I was going up for my next promotion. If you know anything about academia, there's like assistant professor to associate professor, then associate professor to full. And I got stuck at associate to full for an extra year. Um, and, uh, and like that whole year, I was just on a rampage. <laughs> um, so like on the one hand, I would say don't discount, like there is a ton of love for the work that I do, a very deep love. I think bodies, I mean, I, the reason I'm a biological anthropology is I think bodies are the coolest, coolest thing. And uteruses, the original 3D printers, right? <laughs> like, they are, as, as someone who has been pregnant, <laughs> as someone who's been pregnant, as someone who has lost embryos, as someone who has felt that, who has gained that additional interoception sense, of what it means to have things happening in your body and been through that, there are ways that I just have 
this incredibly deep and abiding love for everything having to do with uteruses. And I know that's super dorky, but like that's, so that's the like nice, you know, so there's the spite part where I'm just like, I am gonna get through all of this if I, and I will burn down whatever I need to burn down. And then there's also, there is also like another part of me that's just like, I felt my children when they existed in this different way. And now they exist in this other way. And it's one of the most amazing, joyful gifts I've ever had in my life, right? And like to get to talk about that process and that organ for my job, like how cool is that, right? So I think that's, so again, it's like, it, it's half and half. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was a really, really lovely place to end on. Um, my admiration and respect for Kate is, has no bound. And I'm sure that after the last hour, you can all see why. Please give it up for scientist, fighter, organizer, icon, and now author, <laughs> Professor Kate Clancy. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Ed. That